Meet Bob. Bob's been coming to church for a while now. Amidst the busyness of work and life, he wants to grow closer to the Lord, but he feels like something's missing. He reads his Bible, well, sometimes. He's attending a home group and even listening to podcasts of old sermons. But try as he might, he just feels like something's missing. Then Bob heard a teaching on giving financially. He felt a little convicted, knowing that he and his family were not regularly tithing 10%. But he wondered, does God really command me to give the first 10% to the church? Does the church really even need the money? Or what's in it for me? Why should I give? Bob decided to dig a little deeper and look into it for himself. So he opened his Bible and really didn't know where to look. So he Googled Bible passages about money. He was very surprised to find a large number of verses about tithing, and not just in the Old Testament. Jesus himself taught about tithing to the local church. Now Bob was really feeling convicted. He was beginning to see why the tithe was so important. It wasn't about the church needing money or trying to scam him in some way. It was a question of the heart. I love that video. It talks all about heart. And we're going to get that into that in just a moment. But I just wanted to take a, a few moments and uh, first say good morning. It's good to see you. And secondly, um, just acknowledge the weekend. We are here on Memorial Day weekend. And uh, this weekend was um, designed and, <clears throat> and created way back in 1868 after the Civil War. It was established to recognize those that had fallen in war. And so we want to take a moment and just recognize that if you've served, are serving, if you have a family member in uh, the service, or have, and, and especially if you have lost anyone in, uh, in a war, uh, then we want to just, uh, for a moment, recognize you and uh, tell you thank you so much for your time, the sacrifice, and the, the, the blessing it is that you spent your time giving us our freedom today. So we applaud you. Thank you. And uh, I, in respect of those that have fallen, I'd like to take just the next 30 seconds of uh, silence, if you will. Well, I'm privileged this weekend uh, to spend some time with you guys and talk about the issue and the, the idea of tithing. And uh, that's a tough topic. It's the, one of the, the most difficult topics in all of Christendom. And uh, a lot of pastors uh, avoid it um, because they're afraid to talk about money. I love talking about money. Uh, I love money. And uh, I think that's a good thing. And so it's not a bad thing to talk about. In fact, the Bible, like the video said, it talks a lot about the Bible. In fact, it's one of the most talked about uh, subjects in the Bible. And so we'll, we'll get into that in just a moment. But I just want to start with this idea that um, have you ever had a, a close companion friendship uh, or even your spouse look at you and say, hey, how are you feeling about this relationship? You ever had any of that happen? I mean, my, my wife has said that several times in our relationship. And she's like, how are things going? And I'm like, well, I think it's going pretty good. You know, I, I'm doing good. And she's like, really? Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk. Let's talk. Let's have a conversation. And all of a sudden, we're in this conversation, and I'm realizing that she's trying to make me aware that something's not right, that something's disconnected, that something uh, could be improved upon. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so I'm like, you know, well, t tell me what's going on. Because, you know, guys tend to be a little bit ignorant about or naive or um, just unaware of how things are going sometimes. So it's always helpful. And, and I've, I've, we've had that conversation a long time ago in our relationship. Well, you know, if you really love me, you'd know what's going on. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. 
You know, I really love you, but I'm really clueless. <laughs> and so I need some help. And she goes, you know, and we've, we've even said those things to each other. Like, well, you know, if I give you what, you know, if I tell you what, you, what I need, then it's just going to be a list of things you're doing, right? And, and I'm like, give me the list, you know. <laughs> if you want your needs met, I'm going to have to have a list because I'm clueless. And so... Um, we've gone through those times, and, and I, call, I call that the love mystery. It's like there's a mystery of what you should know, but you're not allowed to know it, so good luck. <laughs> and uh, I, call, I call it that. But um, my wife and I, 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 first of all, I think she's a saint. I think she's... I've been gifted with the better three-quarters of myself. And, uh, or not myself, of what's better than me. <laughs> and uh, I'm just blessed to have my wife Karen in my life for 28 years. And uh, stuck with me through thick and thin, through a lot of thick and not so much thin, but um, a lot of stuff. And I'm blessed to have those conversations. And, and that's really what this conversation is all about. It's about where our heart is in a relationship. When we talk about tithing, and in just a minute, it's all going to kind of start making sense, but when we talk about tithing, there's this relational connection that it's about. It's not about the, 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 the money. It's not about the religious part of it. In fact, this is our big idea. The concept that we want to talk about this morning is, is that um, God is calling us to tithe because of relationship, not riches or religion. I want to establish that right from the beginning of this message because it's so important that it's not in this category. It's not about dollars. It's not about religious activity. It's about relationship. And that'll become more and more clear as we go on. There's an elephant in the room, and that elephant in the room says you know, that, that the church needs money. Let me answer that question very, very clearly. Excuse me. My eyes got all watery there. Um, had something in my eye. Um, <laughs> The church, that's the elephant in the room, is that when pastors talk about money, it's because the church needs it. Well, the answer to that is yes, the church needs money. And the reason for that is, is obvious. There's lights on, there's salaries to be paid, there's, there's, there's the business side of what happens in ministry. And trust me, it would be really cool if we could do ministry without it, but it's just not possible. This is not possible. So the, let's clear the air there. I mean, yes, the church needs money, but the, what the church doesn't need is money givers. Money givers are the type of people that like to give based on the getting. Money givers are the type of people that like to, to, to give based on, on what's in it for me. What, what's it, 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 it needs to be about me, and if it's not about me, then I'm not really interested in giving. What the church really needs, and this is where the message is, is the church does need tithers. And I'm going to define the, the, the difference between these two people because the, the money giver is a kind of a controller and the tither is a worshiper. The tither is someone who is, is loving God and that's all they really care about when they give, is that they're giving because they love God. They, they have every uh, and love of, of who he is and what he is and they have every appreciation for who, what they have. And as a result of that, it's, it's a powerful thing. Um, the potential of the church does not rely on dollars and donors, but on faithful followers. The, the, the potential of the church, the church is, is incredibly potential. Why does this message fit in to beat the odds? Because the odds are, in studies that are being done across America, that only 3% of the church tithes. Only 3% of the church tithes. Tithes. That's, that means that only 3% of the population of the Christian church is giving 10% of their income. And, and that's, it, can you imagine? So that leaves another 97% of potential. The potential of the church does not rely on do dollars and donors, but on faithful followers. And we'll get into this in just a moment, but man, can you imagine, even in your own relationship, it's like, it's like saying you know, to, to your, to your uh, uh, spouse, hey, I, you know, I told you I loved you when I married you, and I'll let you know if things change. It's, it's kind of that. We need faithful followers that are living that out daily, not just on one commitment at one point in time. It's a daily expression. It's a daily uh, life in, in the way we express ourselves. 
So the potential of the church does not rely on dollars and donors. And so we want to skip right to Malachi 3, verse 6. And we find out that this relationship that God is calling us to is, is one that's so powerful and so uh, amazing, that we'll, and we'll also realize how it relates to our own relationship. But the potential, it, it starts with this. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Let's forget that second part for a second and focus on the first, <laughs> because it's good that our... God does not destroy us. But um, <clears throat> I, the Lord, do not change. I remember there's, there's been many times where Karen's come to me and said, hey, how's it going? How's our relationship going? And what she's really saying is something has changed. Something's different here. It's not like it used to be. Remember when we got together the first time and it was really, there's this connection, there's this time. You know, we, when you were dating me, you would spend all this kind of time with me and, you, you know, you don't bring me flowers. Anymore. It, what's going on? Something has changed. God is saying this. He's saying, listen, guys, I, I, the Lord, do not change. In other words, something in this relationship is different and it's not me. Right? That's what he's saying. Something has changed. And and, and, and in this context, we can be happy about this because God is saying, listen, I am a God who does not change, and therefore I have kept my promise, and I have not destroyed you because you've chosen disobedience. You've chosen to go a different direction, but I've chosen not to destroy you. I am committed to this relationship. I'm married to you, not giving up. But I'm calling I'm drawing attention to something that's gone wrong. Something has changed. He goes on to say, ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. You've turned away. So I have this relationship, and I've turned away from it, and I'm walking away from it. I'm not contributing to it anymore. I'm I'm not being a part of this relationship. I'm not connecting to it anymore. I'm turning away. I'm walking from it. And why? Because I've, I've, I've figured out that maybe I'm better off doing my own thing rather than trying to do a together thing. Maybe I'm better off doing my, my own thing and, 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 and leaving that relationship. And I think the Israelites over and over and over again have said, I, I get what God wants to do, but I think I can do it better. I get what God wants to do, but I think I can, I can control my own destiny. I get, and, and we kind of walk away from that relationship. This really is a need to control. Every time we turn away, we're saying, I, I can do it on my own. I, I got this. And, and, and God is saying, man, that, that hurts my heart. I so want relationship with you. And that's what he says in the next verse. He says, return to me. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? And it says, return to me. Man, this is the most beautiful thing. I love my wife whenever she does this to, to our, in our relationship. She says, hey, hello, you've been distant. You've been, uh, you've, been, you've been disconnected. Something isn't right in our relationship. Something's changed. Can you come back? I love that because, and, and at first, and, and, and many times even still, I get a little defensive. I'm like, oh, come on, you know, you're being oversensitive. But that's not true. What she's really saying to me is, I want relationship with you. I want to be connected with you. I want you to be in relationship with me. I want a deeper relationship. I want a totally connected thing going on between us. And will you just return? Will you come back? And that's what God is saying to us. That's what God is saying in his word. Is he's saying, come to me, return to me. I want this deep, meaningful relationship with you. But something's changed. And, and isn't it true that when we have a, a connected relationship, there's a two-way street that's happening, and that two-way part of that relationship is beautiful. But when it's disconnected, it's going this way. Even though there's one person that's even totally connected, when you're walking away, it just gets further and further and more and more distant, and there's nothing that can happen here. And so God is saying, come back to me, come back to me, and I'll come back to you. And then he says, how do we return? Here's the list. Here's the list. Tell me, God, how do I love you? How do do I connect with you? And then he says this, Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. Will a mere mortal 
rob God. And here's the thing that's interesting. No, not really. I mean, none of us have the, the uh, physical power or ability to go to God and pick his pockets. You know, we can't do that. We're not going to break into God's house and, and, and take away from, from him and, 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 and physically rob God. Stick him up, God. It doesn't work. But what we do rob God when we walk away in his most treasured, treasured part of uh, uh, of his relationship. We're robbing him of that. We're robbing him of that closeness, that intimacy. When When I'm disconnected from my wife, I am completely disconnected and I'm robbing her of what she deserves. And that is an intimate relationship with me. Not necessarily because I'm somebody special, but because she is. She deserves that relationship. She deserves that connection. And so when we're disconnected, it's, it's, this, it's this two-way thing. And I'm robbing her. I, we rob God when we tell God, God, I don't trust you. I don't need you anymore. I'm walking away. I'm walking into my own thing. We're robbing him of that relationship. This is what it's all about. We, we tend to make ties all about money, but it's really all about relationships. And we'll get into that, why that money is, is, is important but in just a minute. But we, we un, need to understand that when we pull away, we are actually telling God, I don't trust you. I have more trust in myself than I do in you. Do you know what the opposite of faith is? Anybody? Opposite of faith. Fear? Yep. Anybody else? Disinterest, okay, very good. Disbelief, good. Those are all great answers. Here's one that just floored me the other day as I was listening uh, to, to a pastor speak. He said, the opposite of faith is certainty. Think about it. I'm not going to give unless I have a guarantee. Unless I have something certain that I can put my hand on. I'm not going to, I'm not going to make myself vulnerable to my wife unless I can guarantee that there's going to be a return to that. I have to be certain. If you have certainty, there's no faith. The only person you can be certain in is the unchanging God, the God that doesn't change, the God that that will never let you down, that will always come through, and that is the power of trusting God and the power of coming into a relationship. And when I come into a relationship and I open my heart to my wife, I'm basically saying, I'm, I'm being vulnerable. I'm putting my faith and trust in you to love me. But I'm going to do that by being a contributor to the relationship, regardless of the return. There's something beautiful about that that happens. And so we have this relationship with God, and, God is, and, 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 and we're putting trust in him, but we're robbing him. But he says, in tithes and offerings. Why is that so important? Why is tithes and offerings so important? Because he's the one that provides everything. He's the one that provides it all. And we withhold and say, I can do more with my 100% than you can do with 90%. We're basically saying, God, I, 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 I trust you, I love you, I care about you, but I'm not going to give you everything. I'm not even going to put myself in a place of trust for you to do more with 90 than I can do with 100. It's powerful. It gets really quiet when you say those kinds of things. But the idea of, of returning to him in tithes and offerings is, is what he's really saying is, you've decided that you can do better with everything than I can do when you t- give me your 10. It's a pretty crazy picture. And then he says, you're under a curse. Your whole nation because you are robbing me. Now the reality is it's, it's a curse of a bad relationship. It's not a, a curse of just, just withholding. It's a curse that w- when the relationship's bad, there's consequences to the curse. There's a consequence to a bad relationship. You, you're going to have less intimacy. You're not going to like each other. You're going to nitpick at each other. You're going to have arguments. You're going to have all this stuff. Why? Because the relationship is, is, is hurting. Same thing in this context. There's a curse that comes along with it. It's unhealthy. And then he says, how do you solve it? You bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. 
you bring the whole tithe in, into the storehouse. And the, and the idea is this is 10% and that the storehouse is today would be the modern day church. That there may be food in my house. And in this context, in the biblical context, the Levites were the ones who took care of the, the temple and they were the ones that uh, didn't have a job, but their job was to do everything in the temple. So that, that the tithe took care of all of that. And they took care of all of the benevolence ministries. They took care of all the needs outside of the temple that, that, was, that uh, was functioning in their community. And so today is the same thing. It pays the bills, all that enables the church. Remember, the potential of the church is that we have faithful followers, not just donors and dollars. The, the potential is that we are able to do everything that God is calling us to do and leading us to do as a ministry. And so this is where, this is our response. This is our response is to come to God and say, God, here's my tithe. And when we do that, we, we engage a trust relationship that enables the church to, do its full, to reach its full potential. And it's very, very powerful bring the whole tithe. And then he says this, test me. Test me in this. Trust me. He says, look, watch. And this is the only place in scripture that it says to test God. But right here, trust me. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see what, see if, see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Can you imagine a relationship? I want you to imagine the relationship that you have with a close friend or a spouse, boyfriend or girlfriend, doesn't matter. Can you imagine when there is just a really connected relationship, the overflow of comfort and peace and joy that comes out of that? It's ugly when, when there's a disconnect. It's ugly, but it's amazing when it's not. It's amazing when husband and wife are completely connected, when boyfriend and girlfriend in a godly way are completely connected, when, when you're having friends that you're just getting along with so well, you have these best friends and they, they, you're just connected. There's an overflow of joy. That's what this is all about. Watch what happens when you trust God with 10% and watch what he does with your life, watch what he does. And the abundance, the floodgates, I love that description, the floodgates open up. And I've seen them in, in, in dams where they just open up and there's just an outpouring of this gush of water that comes out. It's amazing. The floodgates that we can't even withhold it. We can't even hold it or store it up. It's overflowing. It's powerful when we're connected with God. Test me. And then he says this. He gives us a very practical perspective. He says <clears throat> that I will prevent pests from devouring your crops. And the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Powerful. It, it, have any of you watched Night and Day with Tom Cruise? And I think it's Cameron Diaz. And, and Tom Cruise is saying, um, with me, you're here. Without me, you're here. With me, you're here. Without me, you're here. Me? Without me. Me? Without me. And, and he just keeps going through this, and Cameron Diaz is like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But, you know, it's, it's this whole protection thing that they're communicating. And, and basically, God is saying the same thing. With me? You're here. Without me? It's devouring crops. It's fruit falling off the vines before it's ripe. And sometimes we ask ourselves, why aren't things going the way they should? Why aren't we getting ahead when I'm keeping all of my money to myself and I'm, I'm not even tithing? Why, why doesn't it feel like it's working? Not under God's umbrella. God can do so much more. I've always had this, this, this belief in my heart that God can do so much more with my $90 with, when I'm trusting him with the tithe, then I can do with $100 when I'm not trusting him with the tithe. It's powerful. It's powerful. I, I, my, my, my car, I've, we, my, my son-in-law and daughter just sold a RAV4, a Toyota RAV4 that we've had for years, 360,000 miles on that car. And we changed the oil, and that's about it. But I mean, I, God's involved in that kind of stuff. 
You know, it broke a couple times and it was easy to fix and all that, but it, the reality is some things last a lot longer when you're faithful in a relationship than when you're not. And when you're in, a, in an unfaithful relationship with God, you're vulnerable. But when you're faithful you're, you're, and you put your trust in him and you put your confidence in him, you, you, you have all the protection you need to keep everything that you have and more and experience the floodgates. And then it says in the very last part of the, the passage in verse 12, then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. There was a couple in a church I pastored uh, a while ago. Her name, uh, their names were Chuck and Patty Sweet. And I always, always admired their relationship. They were just the best couple. And I never saw, they, they didn't always agree, um, but they were just this connected couple that loved to do things together, loved to be together, loved to do things, um, have people over. And every time you go into their house, you're like, oh, it's a safe place. It's a wonderful place. And I always admired their relationship. And that's what happens when we have that connected relationship with God. People look at us and go, whoa, that's, I want that. If, if everyone was tithing here, we would have the potential to, to have that awe moment here in Ventura. Because the potential of ministry ability goes way up. And, and, and I, like I said earlier, I wish, it would, I wish money wasn't an issue in doing ministry. I wish it wasn't at all necessary, but it is. But it also expands potential. It also sp expands the ability to do great things for God. And when we have faithful followers, not money givers, but faithful followers of Christ and tithers, then the potential continues to expand. And the awe moment, that admiration that I have for Chuck and Patty would be part of our, the admiration of our city and our region as we faithfully love on our God through our tithes and our offerings. One last statement. Tithing is about you and God, not you and your church. just want to be super clear about that. It, tithing is, is not about me and my church, me and my pastor, me and my program. Tithing is about me and my God. That's what I love about tithing. God didn't say tithe, tithe, tithe to your pastor, tithe to your program. He said, tithe to me. Show me that you trust me. Show me that you're engaged with me. And when that happens, there's this amazing relational quality that happens. And it happens on a very, very personal and powerful level. And I believe God is calling us to return to relationship with him. The odds are, if we're going to beat the odds, I'd much rather beat the odds as a church of full of faithful followers. Full of people who are not part of the 3%, but we raise that bar. We change the curve and we reach as far as we can. Not because the church needs money, but because the church needs tithers who are faithful followers of Jesus Christ who are committed to just say, God, it's all yours. So if you're here this morning and you're feeling, man, that's a challenge, that's hard, I get it. I get it. We've been tight financially, and there's been those moments where you're going, I don't know how I can tithe. But just from my own personal experience, I don't know how I can't tithe. I don't know how I can't. I've not missed a bill. There's been moments where we didn't know where the money was coming from, and it showed up. And, and we've had those personal miracles of money in the, in, the, in the mailbox and going, where did that come from? How did that get there? What, what? And I can't promise all of that. I can't promise you that your car will last 360,000 miles. But I do know that God is in control. And when we give him that faith and we put our faith and trust in him, it makes all the difference in the world. I pray that today God will challenge all of us to be faithful followers. Not money givers, not controllers, not give to get, 
but worshipers of God, tithers. And I know God's speaking to our hearts today. God, we just thank you so much for everything you're doing in our lives. And thank you for every person in this room. And Lord, even though that these are often challenging uh, words to hear, Lord, they're so good. Because you're calling us to, to relationship with you. You're asking us to return to you. And I pray right now that the power of your Holy Spirit would just speak into our lives and help us embrace relationship with you. That we would put it on a priority level that exceeds every other priority. That, Lord, if there's anything in the way of relationship with you, we would remove it. Forgive us, God, for our our lack of trust. Forgive us for our need for control. Forgive us, God, for those things that are holding us back and allow us to come to you and worship you with everything we have and tithes and offerings included. Maybe you're here this morning and you have yet to make a a decision to follow Christ. Maybe you've you've not, maybe today you've realized that God is calling you to a relationship with him. It's not about money. It's about relationship. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. He was a giver. Long before we ever gave. And he gave his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. If you're here today and you have yet to accept Jesus Christ, all you need to do is pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I accept your love and forgiveness and know that you died on a cross for me so that I could have eternal life. I commit to follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. And maybe you're here this morning and you're not tithing. And you're like, I don't even know how that's going to happen. There's more month than money right now in my life. Well, let me just encourage you to put your trust in God. God is faithful. He does not change and he will fulfill his promise to bless you in the context of your tithe. The best altar that can happen right now is to go home, open up that budget, and rework it to put God first. I love that I can go on my phone right now and push pay and give and worship God through giving. Every time I pay my bills... I pay them by bill pay. And I just have tithes right at the top. And that's the first thing. And when I hit submit, I'm worshiping God every time I hit submit to pay my tithe. I pray God's blessing on you. And Lord, I pray for those that are being challenged right now to tithe, to start tithing. Lord, I pray that you bless them. Lord, one gentleman said there's no, there's no such thing as an ex-tither. Oh, there might be a few out there, but God, I just pray that those that would experience the tithe would also experience your promise of blessing. I pray your blessing on every heart and every mind, and may we become faithful followers of you. We give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name.